Shall we rise? Shall we rise for the singing of our national anthem? No talking now. Ashton Andrews now to lead the congregation with a national prayer. Almighty and eternal God, who through Jesus Christ has revealed your glory to all nations, please protect and preserve Belize, our beloved country. God of might, wisdom, and justice, please assist our Belizean government and people with your Holy Spirit of counsel and fortitude. Let the light of your divine wisdom direct their plans and endeavors, so that with your help, we may attain our just objectives. With your guidance, may all our endeavors tend to peace, 
social justice, liberty, national happiness, the increase of industry, sobriety, and useful knowledge. We pray, O oh God of mercy, for all of us, that we may be blessed in the knowledge and sanctified in the observance of your most holy law, that we may be preserved in union and in that peace which the world itself cannot give. And after enjoying the blessings of this life, please admit us, dear Lord, to that eternal reward that you have prepared for those who love you. Amen. All right, shall we rise again for the singing of our national hymn, with our national hymn, Everlasting, Ever Living. Everlasting, ever living, Lord of earth and sea and sky, ever merciful, forgiving, hear us as we humbly cry, guide our footsteps with your light. before the Lord. Let us pray. Next week we pray for the nation, the, the country, but as we worship, we give God thanks in our spirit, in our minds, in our hearts for the great things, the great place, the freedom that we have here. You would like to understand some people, how they live. And look at the freedom we have today. We can sing in open windows. Now, this is not a joke, but we are, we are too back worship that up in the window. It's air conditioned. It's all right. <laughs> right, Deepak? Yeah, so when you come here, this place, what happened? You feel funny or you feel great? You can't worship in cold places, man. All right, good. Huh? Huh? Well, I don't know, but I think Tina is enjoying marriage. Look at her smile. Right. Look at that one, too. Look there, look there. Ay, ay, ay. No, I like that. You know, man, man, people marry three weeks, one month after, and they come to church. You say, what going on? But Deepak, uh, about the money, whatever you're doing, you're doing it good. Man is smiling too, you know what you do? Tina, you enjoying marriage? You tell him? Have you told him? Beautiful. Deepak, you tell you? 
Ja, 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 ja. Listen, listen. Tina came home, you know, to set up little things and so. And she made a mistake to tell Deepak, I am going home. And he said, what? <laughs> Ask her, home? This is home right now, where you are, <laughs> right? And that is why Deepak is here today, to make sure she understands where home is. <laughs> uh, greet the saints back at the church for me, Swallowfield. You go to a great church, that's where I met my wife. I went there a little lonely, lonely, lonely heart, nobody. And I saw a girl, ah, we fell in love right there in your church. So every time I worship, remember, that's where I got my wife. <laughs> Shall we rise as we lift up our nation today before the Lord in worship? I will give thanks to thee. I will give thanks to thee.
people of the world revere him. For he spoke. And it came to be. He commanded it. And it stood firm. The Lord foils the plans of the nations. He thwarts the purposes of the peoples. But the plans of the Lord stand firm forever. The purposes of his heart through all generations. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. This is the word of the Lord.
lift up our nation before the Lord. Hidden Christ alive forever saved her servant friend and Lord year by year unseen you offer life on dying love not born day by day you walk among us more and honor yet unseen freeing child leading dying if your glory is revealed Christ our hope alive among us day our love our work our prayer we will trust and tell your purpose brave in evil and is in your name this friendly and making peace and setting free showing giving and acclaiming signs of joy and jubilee today has been expected from last week. We went on with kingdom on our hearts and our minds. Remember? It's our beloved Bible teacher. He teaches the Bible in such a beautiful, practical, powerful way. Our brother Arnold Parker. morning church. Am I in the right place? Am I in the sanctuary or in the cemetery? I want to thank um, Daddy Dickey for giving me this opportunity once again to stand and minister God's word. I want to thank the eldership I want to thank the eldership. I must be getting it right somewhere to be called back here again. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. The entrance of your word brings light. It brings understanding to the simple. We pray this morning that you grant us eyes that we may see. Grant us ears that we may hear. Grant us a heart to understand. We pray that you will speak into our various circumstances and situations. That we will receive a word by which we can live by. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. 
This morning, I want to read from two passages of scripture. I want to try to teach and be very calm. Why are you laughing? <laughs> Psalm 132, verse 13 to 15. I'm reading from the English Standard Version of the Bible. Psalm 132, verse 13 to 15. And then I'll read Genesis, Genesis chapter 1, verse 20 to 23. For the Lord has chosen Zion. He has desired it for his dwelling place. This is my resting place forever. Here I will dwell, for I have desired it. I will abundantly bless her provisions. I will satisfy her poor with bread. Genesis chapter 1 verse 20 to 23. And God said, let the waters swarm with swarms of living creatures and let birds fly above the earth across the expanse of the heavens. So God created the great sea creatures and every living creature that moves with which the waters swarm according to their kinds and every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was good and God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the waters in the seas, and let birds multiply on the earth. And there was evening, and there was morning, the fifth day. Today, I want to share very brief, briefly on what I've titled, Walking in the Abundant Provision of God. Walking in in the abundant provision of God. One thing that is indisputable is that our God is a God of abundance. Let me say it again. One thing that is indisputable is that our God is a God of abundance. So I try to disprove it. I try to disprove it. But I found out that you cannot disprove it. When you just observe creation, you know the air that we breathe, there are 8 billion people, but there's enough air for all of us. It is said that there are 3.5 trillion fishes in the earth today that they have discovered. How many? Three point. If, you don't, if you're not able to wrap your head around it, 1 billion is a thousand million. And one trillion is a thousand. And so, if the Earth's population today is eight billion people, then every single person upon the face of the Earth can receive for the year 337 fishes. There is none of us seated here today that he eats half as much in a year. I hope so. <laughs> it is also said that there are 38 billion chickens. Somebody say I like it. <laughs> and 22 billion are do domesticated. So when the Bible says that the, the, the fishes swarm, let the creature swarm. It is no exaggeration. Overall, scientists don't agree. But there are between 50 billion to 430 billion birds that have been discovered. Our God is a God of abundance. And one thing I want to submit to you today is that he wants and he desires his children to walk in abundance. Do I have a witness in the house? He desires and he wants his people to enjoy abundant provision. Did God make the provision of the earth for the wicked? Or did he make it for his people? Is God 
happier when the wicked enjoy abundance and when his children are in poverty. The Bible says, if you that are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your father in heaven? So why do we think we are better than God? Look at the provision we make for our children. Look at, look at the life we want them to live. Look at the things we prepare for them. So why do we think God is any different? In fact, God will do much more. Because if we who are hu human, who are evil, the Bible says... We know how to give good gifts to our children. Say how much more. I remember I was looking for a job after I left college. And you know, sometimes jobs are hard to find. If you have ever been an unemployed, you know how it feels. Okay, these people don't know what I'm saying. <laughs> if you have ever been unemployed, you know how it feels. So I was praying I say, Lord, because I asked God for a specific job. I say, Lord, I want a job that pays me well. Who doesn't want a job that pays them well? Okay. But I also want a job that will release me for ministry. That's what I asked for. And it took God time, but he gave me exactly what I asked for. But I remember while I was waiting on God, and sometimes it's not easy to wait on God. While I was waiting on God, I got frustrated and I, I began to grumble. You know, sometimes we think we are praying, but we are grumbling. Yeah. We are praying, Lord, why? Lord, why? Look at Papa Diki. Why? That is not a prayer. That is complaining. <laughs> While I was waiting on God, I began to complain. And the Lord said, look at your mother. How many interviews has she had you go to? And I began to come. I went to the... I went to this. She, my mother was just opening doors. I went to this interview. I went to this interview. Went to this interview with an oil company. And then the Lord said to me, how much more? Me, your father in heaven. So God wants his people to walk in abundant provision. Can I hear you say amen? amen. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 7 verse 9 to 11. Or which one of you? Which one of you? If your son asks for him for bread, will give him a stone. Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a serpent. If you then who are evil, the, the, the word evil there is in, it's talking about our human nature, our fallen nature. We are not perfect. If you then who are evil know how to give good gifts, someone say good gifts. If you then who are evil know how to good, give good gifts, to your children, how much more will your father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? You see, one of, the, one of the conditions for you to receive God's provision, you have to ask. Even though he knows what you have need of before you ask. He said, ask and it shall be given to you. Seek. So it's a condition. So you cannot just go around and say, God knows what I need. No, you have to ask. It's a condition. He said, you have not because you ask not. You ask and you receive not because you ask amiss. You ask because you want them to know. And God is not in that kind of business. Can I hear you say amen? amen. In 1 Timothy chapter 6 verse 17, it says, He gives us all things richly for our enjoyment. Do you know I was trained in a tradition where, okay, we were, okay, I came from the Roman church. And in the Roman church, they take a vow of what? Poverty. Not so. Do you know that the priests take a vow of poverty? In the room? Meanwhile, they have a car. They have a house. <laughs> All their bills are paid for. <laughs> Give me that vow of poverty any day. <laughs> Am I saying the truth? All their needs are taken care of. And yet it's a vow of so I grew up in that mentality. And so when I was reading 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 17, and it says, he gives us all things richly for our enjoyment. When I saw the word enjoyment, I said, can you? Wow. We serve a good God. Jesus also came to give us abundant life. In John chapter 10, verse 10, he said, I came that you may have life and have it much more abundantly. I mean, life is sufficient also. 
But the word abundant, abundantly means more than you necessarily need. More than you necessarily need. Now let me ask you a question. How many of you, if you go to your, your, your wardrobe today and you open the wardrobe door and you look at your clothes, there's, there are more things that you ne than you necessarily need. <laughs> there are more things that you, than you necessarily need. How many of you women, praise the Lord, if you go to your shoe rack, come on now, and you look at the, sh the shoe closet, am I in the right place? How many of you have more than you necessarily need? You can only sleep on one bed at a time, yet you have four beds in your house. Come on now. So when I speak about abundance, please, it's all around us. Amen. So Jesus came to give us abundant life. And do you know that whenever he performed a miracle of provision, it was always in abundance. Check your Bible. Whenever he performed a miracle of what? Provision. Of what? Pro it was always in a? So the five loaves and two fishes. The five thousand. Am I talking to you somebody? When he was asked for tax. He said to Peter, go and fish. Open the mouth of the fish. The gold coin. That was more than he necessarily needed. So, every, so Jesus was not only demonstrating the will of God by what he said, but also by his very lifestyle and his action. The early church flowed in abundance. Someone say the early church. I was talking to our church the other day. Our church has learned to give because I've taught them to give. Okay? And they did something and I said, but you guys are great, but you're not there yet too. Because in the early church, they gave lands, they gave houses. Come on now. Am I lying? In the early church, they gave lands. I said, you guys, are, you are great. Thank God for you. You are great. But you're not there yet. <laughs> they gave lands. They gave houses so that the work of God will not suffer lack. Am I talking to you, somebody? You see, there's something I've observed in, in, in Belize that is a concern to me. There are many ministers who are, they, they have a job, but they're supposed to be full-time. But how can they go full-time when they're not sure if their needs are not met? But back home, we have seen people who they had a very powerful career. And God said, step out. And because they knew the people understood about giving, they stepped out and their needs are taken care of. My father is a Methodist. Or he was a Methodist, passed on. And he told me, in fact, our, our, my father's side, they are Methodists. My, my great grandfather, my father's grandfather, was a Methodist like bishop. Hmm? My grandparents were both local preachers. And then he told me a story that they gave birth to him at the age of 45. They were, they were not expecting him. So he came from no, no, nowhere. I think the, the sibling before him is nine years older. So, so they said, okay, well, you will serve God. They told him you will serve God. And he said, I won't. And when they insisted... He said, well, I'm going to join the army. Okay? In those days, the army is not like what it is today. In those days, the army used to wear short trousers, you know. You understand? And so when he threatened them that he would join the army, they, they let him go. But later on, my father became the church solicitor. And he told me, he said, Arnold, you see, every Methodist minister, every need is taken care of for the Methodist minister. Every need. When they have children, from the cradle to university, he's taking. I said, no wonder. <laughs> These Methodist ministers, you know, they walk around so. Because the Methodists understand that if the servants of God are going to minister with freedom. Do you remember when Nehemiah went to build the walls of Jerusalem? He found the priests out in the fields farming. And he said, why are you farming? He said, well, the people are not paying tithe. They're not taking care of us. He said, no. And he went back. And he restored the support for the ministers so that they could leave. I believe a generation of ministers must rise in this nation who will be taken care of. Am I talking to you, somebody? Well, that was aside, okay? 
Now turn to your neighbor and help me pray. Say, neighbor, God is not stingy. Say, I know who he is, but it's not my God. <laughs> I know. God is not stingy. The Bible says in James chapter 1, it says, let him ask of God. The word there, ask of God, who giveth to all man liberally, freely, and upbraideth for. The word, the word liberally means God is a giver. Our God is a giving God. For God so loved the world that he... Which of you have ever given your children? But God gave his only begotten son. His only child. Our God is a giving God. He is not stingy. He is a father who is a bountiful giver. So this morning, I hope I've convinced you that God wants you to walk in abundance. But I'll show you from the scriptures if you're not convinced. But I want to share very quickly... How God wants us to walk in abundance. You say, well, why are you sharing this scripture? When I, when I got saved, and the Lord spoke to me about coming to ministry in full time, I began to think about how am I going to survive? So what I did was, you know, the, I was working in the University of Sierra Leone at that time, so they paid me off. I'd been working with them for five years. And so... We had a flat downstairs that was empty, so I furnished the flat. And at that time, there was a United Nations mission that, that, that was in the, the country because we had a war, and so they were renting houses. And I remember the amount of money they paid me for, for that flat for three months was my annual salary. You know these UN, UN people there. Eh? <laughs> so that's how I, I sustained myself in ministry. So when I was sent to start a church, I didn't take salary. I, didn't, I was just serving God and I had something on the side. And then our general overseer traveled out of the country for two years. When he came back, he called us to give an account of the various churches. So after I had, I had reported to him, he said to me, well, what are you doing about salary? I said, salary, I don't take. And he said, no, you should take. I said, no, but I don't need. He said, you should take. So I listened to him and I began to take salary. And when I did, you know what happened? The, the income of the church tripled. And I don't know how. The income of the church, what? Tripled. And then I was, I was I, but I still had this mentality that I have to take care of myself. So I started the first farm. They stole it. I started the second farm. They stole it. I started a business. I got into debt. Okay. <laughs> And then I understood God wants me to shut down everything. And I began to trust God for my needs. And I found out that God is an, a God who provides abundantly. Amen. So I want you to know that the, the message this morning, the messenger is the message. Am I talking to you somebody? The messenger is the message. What I'm talking about is what we have experienced. The abundant provision of God. And there are five revelation keys I have found in my walk with God. Are we together? I have traveled. I remember there was a time I was supposed to travel to Malaysia. But I, I had to go to see somebody, well, my mother in the UK, and then travel from the UK to Malaysia. And I didn't have the ticket from the Sierra Leone to the UK, but I had the ticket from my UK to Malaysia. And I was trusting God. And do you know that somebody gave me a ticket, and up to today, I don't know who, 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 I was trusting God, believing God. And somebody gave me a ticket. What happened was, I told the church I was traveling. And there was a member of our choir, a sister in the church. She went to, um, she went to see a friend. And the, this friend was working in an airline company. And this friend said, as part of her perks for her leave, she was given a ticket. And so she said to this, our member... She said, this ticket that has given to me, this is my first ticket. I want to give it to one of God's servants. Right? And then she said, oh, but my pastor is traveling. <laughs> and so she gave her the ticket. And she said, but tell your pastor, ne never tell your pastor who I am. So this member came and gave me a ticket. And I can tell you stories of stories of God's supernatural provision. Am I talking to you, somebody? So God is a God who provides. The stories in the Bible about manna from heaven, not, in our day, God can still provide. Am I talking to somebody? 
Okay. So very quickly, I want to share five revelation keys to walking in God's abundance. And now when I talk about abundance, I'm not just talking about material provision. God's provision covers every area of our lives. How many areas? So if you need peace, God will provide peace. If you need protection, God will provide protection. If you need every area. Firstly, the first key shows us how to locate God's provision. The first key. We're talking about walking in the abundant provision of God. So the first key shows us. Am I teaching? I'm doing very well also. I'm not shouting. Okay. The first key shows us how to locate God's provision. And last week, I made it clear. God's provision or God's provisions are in his promises. Where are God's provision? 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3 and 4. His divine power has provided us all that we need for life and godliness. Through the knowledge of him, so comes through knowledge of him that calls us unto his grace and glory, unto his grace and virtue. Through these, verse 4, he has given us his exceeding great and precious promises, so that by them, so God's provision is found in his promises. So every area of your life, God has provided for you. Every area. But where are these provisions? They are in the promises of God. In Joshua chapter 23, Joshua chapter 23, Verse 14, hear what Joshua says about the promises of God. I'm reading from the New Living Translation. Soon I will die, going the way of everything on the earth. Deep in your hearts, you know that every promise the Lord your God, of, your, of the Lord your God has come true. Every promise of the Lord your God has what? Not a single one. Has failed. But as, as surely as the Lord has given you the good things He promised, He will also bring disaster on you if you disobey Him, etc., etc. So Joshua, at the end of his life, as he was about to hand over to another generation, he said, Look, which of you can deny this fact? That what God promised, He was there when God told him, Let's leave. You're going to a land of promise. You're going, He was there. He was there when God told him, I will, I, will, I will carry you on the eagle's wings. I will watch. And he saw. And so he said, all the promises of God, none of them have failed. All have come to pass this day. But when it comes to receiving God's promises, it takes faith. Someone say faith. We have to learn to trust God. You see, faith is, the, is an issue of the integrity of God. God is not a man that he should lie. He's not the son of man. That, so if we trust the integrity of God, I remember there was a time God was challenging me to believe him for something. Challenging me to believe him for something. And I said to the Lord, I'm afraid. You might fail. You understand? Okay, I know you, you will act spiritual, but I will say, I will say, say, Lord, what if it does not work? Eh? What if it does not work? And then the Lord said, okay, let me teach you about my goodness. And he took me to Psalm 149. He began to teach me about the goodness of God. About he opens his hands and he satisfies the, the, the desires of every living thing. And, that, and, and after he had taught me, after I had gone, for about months, I was just, and then I got the, the faith. So now trust him. Am I talking to you, somebody? So we need faith. And how does faith come? First of all, faith comes from your relationship with God. Because out of your relationship with God, God will speak to your heart. God will inject faith to you. Am I talking to you, somebody? You see, your, your, your relationship with God must cover every area of your life. It must, just not, it not, must not just be limited to Sundays and Wednesdays. It must not just be limited to spiritual things. God cares about every area of your life. I remember... When we're getting married, Alison and I, what we did was we prepared and planned and prepared for two years. And remember, I, had, I, had, I was working in the provinces, in the, in the interior of our country, where they had have mahogany wood, beautiful wood. And I, I had them make a bed for me, 
beautiful bed, six by six. But then I brought it to town and I stored it in, in the house of a friend of mine. And I did not know that the, 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 the room, the store was leaking water. And by the time I got there, the, 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 the wood was marred. So I, t- I took the bed and I said, I'm going to have them, you know, you know that dark, that dark, that dark brown paint, you understand? To that stain, you understand? So I took it, and, but when I went there, I saw that they could also spray the beds, gold and yellow. But, so, so I, said to, I said to the carpenter, I said, I want you to just spray this bed for me. Then I left, because when I asked for the cost of the spray work, eh? <laughs> okay, so I left. When I left, as I was walking away, the Lord spoke to me. Someone say relationship. And he said to me, don't you think I can, I can do it for you? Don't you think you, why don't you spray the bed? I said, Lord, are you sure? He said, go ahead. I don't have the money. <laughs> so I went back and I, you know, I, you know, pull chairs, eh? I said, no, coming to think of it, spray it. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> faith is born out of your relationship with God. Remember, faith comes by what? Hearing. So I had God. He spoke to me. So, I, 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 so the next day or so, I was talking to an aunt. Now, in our culture, our relatives, when you get married as a young man, they look if you have everything, and they're very cheeky. They're very what? So they, my aunt was saying, do you have a bed? And I said, what are you saying? You're getting married. Do you have a bed? I said, I have a bed. I said, but I'm now, I'm now. So when I told her everything I had to get married, she said, what can I do? I said, well, I am spraying this bed. <laughs> <laughs> and so, was that coincidence? <laughs> or was that God? And so, she, that's how I paid for the, Am I talking to you, somebody? So, faith is born out of your relationship with God, number one. But number two, if you don't have faith in a certain area, because all of us here have faith. All of you seated here, you have faith. Without exception. Now, how many of you believe that Jesus is the Son of God? You believe that? That's faith. Were you there when he died? Were you there when he was buried? When you there when, but you're here, and every day you worship him, you celebrate him, you have faith. But you may not have faith in a certain area. So how do you get faith in a certain area that you don't have? Romans chapter 10 verse 17. So then faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the so in that area that you need faith, you need to go to the word. Am I talking to you, somebody? If you need protection, go to the word. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Whom shall I? When an army surrounded me, am I talking to you, somebody? No weapon formed against you. So you need to go to the word. The area that you don't have faith, you go to the what? So whatever you need, God has provided there's a song, was it Ron Kenoli who, who sang that song? He's already provided. He's already provided. But the provision is in the word. So through your relationship with God and through the word of God, you can have faith. The second key is our redemption guarantees us abundance. Our redemption guarantees us Abundance. The first key is God's provisions are in his promises. The second key is our redemption. Our redemption guarantees us abundance. Galatians chapter 3 verse 13 and verse 14. It says Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. Being made a curse for us. As it is written, curse is everyone that hangs on a tree. That the blessing of Abraham might come upon us Gentiles, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Is that in your Bible? Christ has what? Redeemed us. So Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law. So everybody who did not pay attention to the law, who did not obey the law, in the eyes of God, was under a curse. If you want to find out where those curses are, 
Read Deuteronomy chapter 28 from verse 16 downwards. You will see where the, the curses are. Everybody who did not obey the law of God was under a curse. And the curse was threefold. Well, fourfold. First of all, it was spiritual death. Spiritual what? Secondly, it was poverty. Thirdly, it was disease. And fourth, it was failure or humiliation. Am I talking to you, somebody? So when we come to Christ, what Christ did on the cross was not only to bring us forgiveness of sins, but to pay the price for our freedom from those curses. So we are free from the curse of poverty. Am I talking to you, somebody? Now, somebody will say, but those blessings are blessings for Israel. You are mistaken. They are blessings of Abraham. They are what? They are blessings for the descendants of Abraham. Are there any descendants of Abraham in this place? If you are Christ, you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So our redemption, but what did Christ do? He redeemed us from the curse, but he also redeemed us to the blessing. Someone say to the blessing. Many of God's people are, believe, are living below their rights as believers. They're believe, living below their privileges. You know why? Because we don't understand that God has redeemed us from, but he's also redeeming us to. Can I hear you say amen? God has redeemed us what? And he's redeeming us. So when God told Moses, because... The, the church in the wilderness, the church from Egypt to the promised land is a picture of the church of Jesus Christ. And it says the things that were written in the past, they are for our admonishment, admonition and are for our instruction. Am I talking to you, somebody? We're supposed to learn. So God, are you with me? This place is hot too. I think I need to drink some water. Christ has redeemed us from, but he's also redeeming us through, too. So what happened? God said to Moses, deliver my people from Egypt, but take them to the promised land. So what the cross does for us is to deliver us from. Am I talking to you? But the cross is not our destination. Let me come over here. They seem to understand me on this side better. <laughs> the cross is not our destination. The cross redeems us. The throne is our destination. I say the throne. Do you know the church never began until Jesus sat on his throne? Read, read Acts chapter 2, when Peter was explaining the day of Pentecost. He said, having received the promise of the Father, he has what? Poured it out. Then you read Hebrews chapter 1. In Hebrews chapter 1, we understand that Jesus was inaugurated as King of kings and Lord of lords. He was, he was anointed with the oil of gladness. And what he was anointed with, he started the church with. So the church... Our destination is not the cross. Our destination is the throne. We will never forget about the cross because even in heaven, they sing about the cross. But where are they? They are around the throne. Am I talking to you, somebody? They are around the... So in as much as we sing songs around the, about the cross, we must sing songs about the throne because our destination is not the cross. The cross delivers, the, delivers us from sin from all of these things, and it delivers us to eternal life. Am I making sense? You people are making me walk too hard. Are we together? So Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, but he didn't stop there. He redeemed us how? By becoming, but he redeemed us, why? So that the blessings of Abraham might what? Come on us. So he redeemed us to the blessings of Abraham. Someone say the blessings of Abraham. Now when you read about the blessings of Abraham, the scriptures record in Genesis chapter 24, verse 1, that the blessings of Abraham are all inclusive. 
They are all what? Am I making sense this morning? Okay, I'll be out of your face very soon. Okay? Oh, praise the Lord. The blessings of Abraham are what? All inclusive. Genesis chapter 24, verse 1. Are we there? It says, now Abraham was old. That's a blessing. I say that's a blessing. Long life. That your hair fall out. You have to use dentures and your banking. That's a blessing now. <laughs> Is that not a blessing? Now Abraham was old. And well advanced in age. And the Lord had blessed Abraham in all things. The Lord had blessed Abraham in what? Not just some things, but what? All things. Now look at Genesis 24, verse 34 to verse 36. Genesis 24, verse 34 to 36. Am I, am I getting across to you? Genesis 24, verse 34 to 36 says, So he said, I am Abraham's servant. The Lord has blessed my master greatly, and he has become great, and has given him flocks and herds, silver and gold, male and female servants, and camels and donkeys. And Sarah, my master's wife, bore a son to my master when he was old, and to him he has given all that he has. So the blessing, this was, this was Abraham's servant, the servant he sent to go and find a wife for Isaac. Eh? To convince them to release their daughter. Look at his testimony. Of, he said, do you know the, 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 the prospective bridegroom? Do you know who his father-in-law is? Eh? Let me tell you. He is blessed in all things. He has gold. He has silver. He has male Would you not release your daughter to such a... <laughs> The servant made a very good case. Amen? Now, some people say the blessings of the New Testament are spiritual, not material. That is not the case. The blessings of the New Testament are foremostly spiritual. Someone say foremostly. Well, you say, but Jesus did not talk so much about material things. Jesus was sent to the house of Israel. He was sent to Jews. Is that not so? In their 1,500 years of history, all they knew was material blessings. So Jesus did not have to talk about those things. They were convinced that God wanted to, them to be blessed materially. Am I talking to you, somebody? Some people say, well, Jesus never spoke about tithing or, or, or sacrifice. Why should Jesus speak to the Jews about that? Their whole 1,500 years, they have been tithing. It, it, it's not a message to the Jews anymore. Do you understand what I'm saying? So Jesus tried to make, make them understand that the blessings of Abraham now are, are foremostly, some say foremostly, spiritual. But I'm going to show you from scripture there are also earthly blessings. Because the blessing of Abraham is all inclusive. Can I hear you say amen? If I was back home, I would say I like it. Do you like it? I like it. Okay. Covers everything. Okay. So when you look at the blessings of Abraham, they cover three things. Influence, fruitfulness. No, four things. Influence, fruitfulness, well-being, abundance. Influence, fruitfulness, well-being, and those are the blessings of Abraham. Okay. So first of all, the provision of God is in the promises of God. Secondly, our redemption guarantees what? Abundance. It guarantees abundance. Thirdly, service. Service provokes abundance. Somebody say service. Okay, service. <laughs> okay, I distinctly heard an American twang. Service. Is that better? <laughs> Service provokes abundance. Okay? 
Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 47 to 48. Deuteronomy 28, 47 to 48. Because you did not serve the Lord your God with joy and gladness of heart for the abundance of everything, therefore you shall serve your enemies whom the Lord will send against you in hunger, in thirst, in nakedness, in need of everything, and he will put a yoke of iron on your neck until you be destroyed. Those, those things, don't worry about those things. We are redeemed. You understand? They, they don't concern us. <laughs> you understand? Christ has redeemed us from those things by his blood. Okay? But he said, because you, you, you did not serve the Lord your God with joy and glad. The one thing I said, about, I said about the promises of God last week was they are conditional. Not so. They are what? So the condition here, God says, because you do not serve the Lord your God with joy. You know, it, 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 you, when you serve God, it's not just that you serve God. You have to serve God with the right attitude. You have to come to church with the right attitude. Okay? Don't come to church and okay, go, okay, I'm here. <laughs> no, you know, our children can behave, behave like that, not so. They don't want to come to church and say, okay, I'm, I'm coming. And then when you're singing, they, they, don't, they don't want to lift their hands because they're... But he said, because you did not serve the Lord your God with, with, with joy and gladness of heart. And what will this produce? For the abundance of all things. Am I talking to you, somebody? Exodus 23, 25. Exodus 23, 25. You shall serve the Lord your God and he will bless your bread and your water. And I will take sickness away from among you. Somebody say service. He said, you serve me, I will bless your bread. I will bless your water. Okay? Okay? What does that mean? You go, you're going to eat well. Yeah. I mean, if you eat plain rice, is that a blessed food? I mean, hmm? rice, rice, and, rice and butter, is it blessed food? Okay, so when he said, I will bless your bread and your, water, your food, that means that you know, <laughs> it will not be. You don't have Gary here. Do you have Gary in this country? Okay, cassada flakes. You don't have it. Okay. Back home, we make cassada into flakes, okay? Something like cereal. Hmm? Okay. Job 36, verse 11. Job 36, verse 11. If they obey and serve him, they shall spend their days in prosperity and their years in pleasure. That is in your Bible. If they obey and what? They shall spend their days in what? Prosperity. And their years. In... So service. Someone says service. 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 Okay. <laughs> okay. I remember a brother in church. He was a police officer. He did very well in high school. He was a senior prefect in high school. Did very well. But because he, he loved the police force, he decided to leave high school with a very good result and to go straight and become a police officer. Uh, he rose in rank to about sergeant. But he loved to serve God. He was all over the place. Anything he could do for God, he would serve God. Anything he could do for God. And then one day, the Lord spoke to him to resign his job. So he resigned his job. Not knowing what next, he resigned. And then, he thought that God wanted him to go into full-time ministry because he loved to serve. I remember one day he came to our church. He, le he was a praise and worship, a song leader. He le and then he would go out on evangelism. And before you know it, he would go and visit this. And, and what, weeks passed and there was nothing. He had resigned his job. He was at home. Months passed, there was nothing. But he continued to serve God. And then we had the special court set up in Sierra Leone. Okay, Sierra Leone, we had a war, and then they set up a special court to try war, the war crimes and everything. And when they set up this special court, they asked for people to be security guards and officers. And he felt the Lord impress in his heart that he should, he should um, apply. And this was about six months or so after he had left his job, and he was just serving God. 
And so he applied, and, he, and because of his years of experience and everything, he got a very good position as a security officer. And he said, he said to me, my one month salary was the 11 years of gratuity that they gave to me. He said, my, 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 just, my, <laughs> and his life changed overnight from a, from a small house. He, he rented a house on the third floor. His life changed overnight, overnight. And all you could say about him, he served God. That's all you could say about him. Am I talking to you, somebody? Service. The Bible says God delights in the prosperity of his servants. Hello? You say, well, why are you saying this? Because I was afraid that if I serve God, I'll, I'll die poor. I was afraid I was, I, I got, I was, because of where we were coming from. But you look back and you say, no, God, God that's not God. Service provokes abundance. So when we, when we serve, let us realize that God will now remember us. And some of us, you're going to see your children, your children explode in some things. There was, a, there was a, a lady, no, a mother. She was a mother in our nation. And she had a burden to pray for Sierra Leone. And that was all God called her to do. See, we're all called to do different things. When you find out what you, you're called to do and you do it, that's your ministry. Am I talking to you, somebody? If you're called just to sweep the church and you do it, okay, and you do it with all your heart, that's your ministry. So her ministry was to pray for our nation. And she organized prayer meetings after prayer meetings after prayer meetings. You know what happened? One of her sons became the personal assistant to the president. Another of her sons... I mean, he's like an economic advisor for the country. Presently, he's running one of the biggest banks in Sierra Leone. It's like, the Bible says, the seed of the upright shall be mighty. The generation of the righteous shall be blessed. Can I hear you say amen? The seed. So she served God. She was not looking, but when you look at her sons, you can see that they are great in the land. Am I talking to you, somebody? So service provokes a bonus. I'm about to close. The next key. Sacrifice yields abundance. Someone say giving. As a pastor, I found out that when you begin to talk about money, the place goes quiet. Thank God, I am not, your, I'm not going to stay here. And also, I can say anything and I can go. Yes. Giving and sacrifice Yields abundance. Somebody say giving. I want to read 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 6 to verse 8. And I'm reading it from the Amplified Translation of the Bible. I'm reading it from what? The Amplified Translation of the Bible. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 6 to 8. I'm almost done. It's only 12.48. I'm, I'm doing well, eh? I'm doing well. Back home when I say I will not preach for long, they just look at me and laugh. Because when I'm back home, it's like I don't want to stop. But praise the Lord. Second Corinthians chapter 9, verse 6 to 8. Now remember this. He who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. Okay, sparingly, sparingly, varies, varies. And he who sows generously that blessings may come to others will also generous will also reap generously and be blessed. Let each one give. Someone say give. So he's likening our giving to sowing. Is he not likening our giving to sowing? Do you see that? He said, "He that so spirally shall reap." He that, so he said, "But he said, let each one give. How? Thoughtfully, and with purpose." Just as he has decided in his heart, not grudgingly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver and delights in the one whose heart is in his gift. Look at verse 9. And God is able to make all grace, every favor, an earthly blessing. Somebody say all grace. 
If you read the old King James, it says all grace abounds towards you. But the Amplifiers is now expanding. They say every favor and earthly blessing. If you have ever studied the word grace, the word grace is an elastic word. Is it what? Sometimes it talks about God's mercy and love. Sometimes it talks about God's divine enablement. Sometimes it talks about God's power and strength. Paul says, my grace is sufficient for you. My strength. So in that case, here grace is talking about earthly blessings. Someone say earthly blessings. Earthly. Earthly. <laughs> earthly blessings. Are we together? <laughs> earthly blessings. <laughs> earthly. You don't know that you have an accent. So <laughs> <laughs> it says, and God is able to make all grace. Somebody say all grace. All grace. All grace. All grace. Every favor and earthly blessing come in abundance to you so that you may always, under all circumstances, regardless of the need, have complete sufficiency in everything, being completely self-sufficient in him and have an abundance for every good work and act of charity. Wow. Somebody say all grace. So that you can, God wants to bless you so that you can be a blessing. If you don't have enough for yourself, how can you be a blessing for others? Am I talking to you, somebody? So it says, God loves a cheerful giver. But when it comes to the area of sacrifice, somebody says sacrifice. You see, there are two levels of giving. There are free will offerings. There are various levels of giving. Free will offerings. There are vows that you make to God. And there, are, there is sacrifice. Sacrifice, the scripture says, he that goes out bearing precious seed with tears shall, upon, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing. Sacrifice is when you give something to God that costs you. That what? I remember I was, I went to the doctors and as I sat on the balcony waiting for the doctor to call me, on the opposite side of the road, I saw this shop selling pulpits. Beautiful pulpits. So I went across the road and I chose one and I bought it. As soon as I bought it, the, the Lord said, give this one to that pastor. <laughs> as soon as I finish, but he said, Give this one to her. Today, the pastor has built a massive church. On his altar is the pulpit I bought for him. I had to buy another, another, another pulpit that is beautiful, but it was not that one. <laughs> I remember I went to the shop. I went to the shop to buy to a, a, a boutique to buy a shirt. I picked out this beautiful shirt. And as soon as I had bought it, the Lord said, when you go to the meeting tonight, give it to your pastor. So, I, so what I did was, I bought another shirt. What did I do? You see, sometimes God has already told us what to do, but we are, we are acting smart. I'm not talking about you, I'm talking about myself. Not so. so I bought another shirt. And I went to the pastor's wife and I presented the two shirts. I said, which one of these would your husband love? <laughs> and in my heart, I was saying, choose this, choose this, choose this. I'm not talking about you, know, so you know, like that. <laughs> Somebody say sacrifice. So the night, that night I went to the service, I gave, I gave God's servant the shirt. Then I was in the service and he, he said a word of prophecy. He said, as you leave the building today, as you go outside, you're going to receive a, a phone call. And I said, I was standing, I said, I receive it. My shirt. <laughs> I, know, I'm not, I know you're different also. You do everything. You don't. You know what happened, Papa Dicky? As soon as I got out, somebody called me. A cousin who had lived in the UK for years, she had never called me. She called me and she said, Arnold, I, I just remembered you and I sent some money for you. When I got home, is, then I realized that, eh, what that man said came to pass time. Am I talking to you, somebody? So listen to me. I know for a fact 
that sacrifice and giving yields abundance. But you know who knows more than I? Alison, my wife. One day we were in service and the worship was going on. Beautiful worship like we have today. And I was worshiping. She touched me. I said, did you hear? I said, hear what? He said, the Lord asked me to empty my bank account. And I just said, okay, you can't. Don't, 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 inc don't include me in your matters. <laughs> I, said, I said, don't include me in your matters. Don't include me. Do you know what she did? She emptied her bank account. Because not the pastor told her, the Lord spoke to her. Papa, do you know, know, know what happened? That month, they announced a salary increase and they gave 11 months drawback. That means they, they backdated it 11 months. And so when she collected what she, it was more than her salary for the month. <laughs> Only God could know that. Am I talking to you, somebody? Only God could know that. And she has not done it once. She did it another time. She entered her bank account. Praise the Lord. Somebody says sacrifice. Okay. Some of us have the gift of giving also. But don't say, oh, well, I don't have the gift. We're all supposed to give. Don't say, I don't have. We're all supposed to. Don't say, I don't have the gift. We're all supposed to give. <laughs> you say, let every man give. You understand? Some of us will give more than others, but we're all to give. Okay. She emptied her bank account and she was studying for her first, first master's. And she, she needed to buy the textbooks. And the textbooks were really expensive. And a, a former boss who had worked with her sent from the States all of the textbooks. Thousands of dollars worth of textbooks for the course. Free of charge. Am I talking to you, somebody? So listen to me. The messenger is the message. Am I talking to you, somebody? The messenger is the message. When you give, it provokes abundance. You know, don't, you know, in everything, there's always excess. There's always error, not so. There are people who do it for greed. But what I've found out is that when you properly teach people about their responsibility and their duty to give, God will talk to them. We are building our church, and we have built the basement of the church, which is the children's ministry. The church is supposed to be upstairs. So meanwhile, we're meeting in the children's ministry. And when we finished the building, we were exhausted financially. You know, you can give and give and give. And give. So I just stopped it. And when we stopped, there was no ceiling. Okay, we used some beautiful material to cover the ceiling. When you look up, you think that is a design. No, we're hiding something. You understand? <laughs> and then there was no tiles on the floor. And then Alison just told them, we're about to celebrate our Thanksgiving service this year in February. And Alice said, but, but we have been, we've been here for over a year. The, look at the ceiling. Look at the floor. And five people, without us asking, they tiled the floor and they did the, the, the ceiling. Am I talking to you, somebody? And when we look at the lives of those people, you can see how God has blessed them. Somebody says sacrifice. Let me give you some more testimonies. In the area of service, the Lord challenged me when I finished university not to work for anybody, but to serve him for two years before I start to work for myself. So nobody told me that. In fact, when I went to tell my pastor that I was going to serve God, he said, no, go and do your master's. I said, well, you, know, you, know, you, can't, you didn't hear God. <laughs> he said, go and do it. He told me, go and do your master's. I said, well, no. So I went, and I went two years. Then when I came back, I got a job with the University of Sierra Leone. And within a couple of years, I was married. And you could not tell that I had given two years to God in service. You could not tell. So I, I usually always share this story to challenge younger people to serve God. I was sharing this story and one, my, one of our pastors today, one of our pastors today, he had this story and when he graduated from college, he served in our administration for five years. For how many years? He didn't tell me. We're paying him, actually, but it was minimum wage. Somebody say minimum wage. He has studied accounting and other things, finance, but he served in our administration. After the five years, he took a job 
with an NGO. This, this year will mark his fourth year in that job. He has been promoted three times. He has been what? His life is so turned around. He's now married. He has two sons. And you can never tell that he gave up five years. Those who were his, fellow, his, his mates who graduated with him, he has now caught up with them and overtaken them. So when I say service, when I say these things, I have seen it with my own eyes. Am I talking to you, somebody? So giving and sacrifice, they yield. They yield abundance. Finally, abundance. Somebody say abundance. Obedience brings abundance. Somebody say obedience. Even though we're redeemed from the curse of the law, it does not mean that we're ex we, we, can, we are excluded or we are exempt from the conditions of the promises of God. Does that make sense? So as for the curse, you are redeemed. Price pay the price so you can be free from those curses. But as for the blessings, they don't come automatically. They're in the promises of God. And every promise in Deuteronomy chapter 28 is based upon obedience. It says, it shall come to pass if you hearken diligently unto the voice of the Lord your God to observe and to do all that is commanded you, all these blessings shall come upon you and they shall what? Overtake you. So we are on a journey. Someone say we are on a journey. And one of the journeys we're on is to walk in God's abundant provision. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your word. We thank you for opening our eyes and giving us understanding. Lord, we pray that we will not be like the woman who was given a gift, a deed of gift. Can I say this? Can I say this? There's a story I usually tell that I had. There was this woman, she served a very wealthy British man for years. You know those British lords that have 23 bedroom houses, not so? They have their own private cricket field. And she served him for 23 years, so for years. And, but he didn't have children, but he had relatives. When he died, they read the will. When they read the will, the lawyer just presented her with a portrait. The lawyer said to her, your Lord said that you can stay in this house. This house is yours. It's yours. It belongs to you. This, and he said, this portrait is yours. But he had been always asking the woman to get an ed education. Get a what? Okay. So this woman took this portrait. The portrait was just a document that was... She put this portrait in her house. One day, I think it was her niece or nephew came to visit her. And she said, what is this portrait? Oh, she said, oh, my late Lord gave it to me. I said, but this is a, 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 a deed of gift for the entire property. He said, you're hanging it on the wall. But this is a diff, deed of gift. for the, Do you know the Bible is a de deed of gift to us? But none of us read it. We don't know what is in it. Am I talking to you, somebody? She hung that, she hung that portrait very proudly, living in that small house. Meanwhile, it was a deed of gift for the entire estate. May the Lord grant us understanding in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. <laughs> she didn't know that she was rich. This. Brother Parker thinks he's at home right now, right? <laughs> Shall we rise? Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him, all creatures. Lord. Praise him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. God.
God is able to make all grace abound toward you that you always having all sufficiency in all things may have an abundance by the help and power of the Holy Spirit for the glory of his name. God bless you. Let Brother Parker know it was a blessing.